psychology is the study of the mind. And sometimes studies are done which find results we don't really want to know about, or show results which were obtained in an extremely unethical manner. In this video will be going over five such studies. First, there is Liebert's challenge to free will. When we act, it generally feels like your decisions are your own. However, Benjamin Liebert's study using electrocephalography, or EEG, appear to show that preparatory brain activity precedes your conscious decisions of when to move. And one of the controversial interpretations of the study is that it challenges the notion that you have free will. The decision of when to move is made non-consciously, so the argument goes, and then your subjective sense of having willed that act is tagged, tagged on afterwards. Liebert's study and others like it have inspired deep philosophical debate. For instance, when a criminal commits a crime, are they deciding to do it, or has it already been decided, unconsciously? Do we have culpability if we are not consciously making a decision? Some philosophers like Daniel Dennett believe that neuroscientists have overstated the implications of these kinds of findings for people's conception of free will, while other researchers have pointed out flaws in Liebert's research, such as people's inaccuracy in judging the instant of their own will. However, the principle of non-conscious neural activity preceding conscious will has been replicated using different methods such as fMRI and influential neuroscientists like Sam Harris continue to argue that Liebert's work undermines the idea of free will. The next study we'll be looking at is the Daryl Bem Precognition Study. In 2010, social psychologist Daryl Bem attracted huge attention when he claimed to have shown that many established psychological phenomena work backwards in time. For instance, in one of his experiments, he found that people performed better at a memory task in the present for words that they revised in the future. Bem interpreted this as evidence for precognition or psi, that is, effects that can't be explained by current scientific understanding. Superficially, at least, Bem's methodology appeared to be robust and he took the laudable step of making his procedures readily available to other researchers. However, the criticism comes in the fact that many researchers were unable to replicate the results and those failed replications were allowed to be published in the journal that published BEM's original study which is the Journal of Personality and Psychology. So this prompted quite an uproar in the research community and contributed to what has become known as the replication crisis or the replication wars particularly in psychology. However, BEM didn't seem to mind about that too much and he published a further meta-analysis and concluded that overall there was solid support for his earlier work. Where will this controversy head next? If Bem is right, you probably know the answer already. The third study is the Lot in the Mall study, and the results are quite a lot more interesting than the title suggests. In 1995 and 1996, Elizabeth Loftus, James Cohen and Jacqueline Pickerel documented how easy it was to implant in people a fictitious memory of having been lost in a shopping mall as a child. The false childhood event is simply described to a participant alongside true events, and over a few interviews it soon becomes absorbed into the person's true memories so that they really think that they experienced getting lost in a mall. The research and other related findings became hugely controversial because it showed how unreliable and suggestible memory can be. In particular, this cast doubt on the so-called recovered memories of abuse that originated during many sessions of psychotherapy. This is a highly sensitive area and experts continue to debate the nature of false memories, repression and recovered memories. However, one challenge to the Lost in the Mall study was that participants may really have had a childhood experience of having been lost, in which case Loftus's methodology was recovering lost memories rather than the incident of implanting false memories. 
This criticism was refuted in a later study in 1996, in which Loftus and her colleagues implanted in people the memory of having met Bugs Bunny in Disneyland. For anyone who is so comically inclined, they would know that there is no Bugs Bunny at Disneyland, so they could not possibly have seen him. Fourth study, and perhaps the most damaging, controversial, and unethical study of the list, is the conditioning of Little Albert. This isn't a recent study, but I thought I had to talk about it because it just is so bad what they did to this kid. Back in 1920, John Watson and his future wife, Rosalie Rayner, deliberately induced fears in an 11-month-old baby. They did this by exposing him to an animal, such as a white rat or rabbit, and at the same time they exposed him to this animal, they began banging a steel bar above his head. The research is controversial, not just because it seems so unethical, but also the way because the results have tended to be reported in an accurate and oversimplified manner. Many textbooks claim that the study shows how fears are easily conditioned and generalized to st similar stimuli. They say that after being conditioned to fear a white rabbit, Little Albert subsequently feared all things that were white and fluffy. In fact, the results were far messier and more inconsistent than that, and the methodology was poorly controlled. Albert was about one year old at the end of the experiment, and he reportedly left the hospital shortly thereafter. Though Watson had discussed what might be done to remove Albert's conditioned fears, he had no time to attempt such desensitization with Albert, and it is more than likely that the infant's fear of furry and white things continued post-experimentally and possibly for the rest of his life. Lastly, we're going to be talking about Seligman's look into learned helplessness. During the late 1960s, psychologists Martin Seligman and Stephen F. Mayer were conducting experiments that involved conditioning dogs to expect an electric shock after hearing a tone. Seligman and Mayer observed some unexpected results from their study. When initially placed in a shuttle box in which one side was electrified, the dogs would quickly jump over a low barrier to escape the shocks. Next, the dogs were strapped into a harness where the shocks were unavoidable. After being conditioned to expect a shock they could not escape, the dogs were once again placed in a shuttle box. Instead of jumping out over the low barrier to escape, the dogs made no efforts to escape the box. Instead, they simply lay down, whined, and whimpered. Since they had previously learned that there was no escape possible, they made no effort to change their circumstances, and the researchers called this behavior learned helplessness. For obvious reasons, Seligman's work is considered controversial because mistreating the animals involved in the study. However, the study also has wider, a wider range of applicability. For instance, many people in poor socioeconomic conditions may acquire that learned helplessness because they feel that there is no way of them getting out of the situation they're in. And that's this video. If you enjoyed it, found it interesting, and so on, please like it, and if you want to watch some more similar to this, subscribe to the channel. Thanks.